good afternoon. And thank you for coming to Smithsonian Gardens weekly webinar series, Let's Talk Gardens. You can see it's a beautiful fall day. Look behind me, the foliage is turning. Uh, it's gorgeous, the sun is shining. And so we're so appreciative that you've come to listen to us instead of being outside in your gardens. But today's presentation will help you a lot with how to keep your gardens as neat and tidy as you would like them to be and to make your life a little bit easier too. Today, we ask that you put your questions in the chat box and at the end of the presentation, I'll, I'll come back on and I will ask our speaker, Aaron Clark, the questions that you have posed. If we don't get to all the questions during the webinar, uh, we will answer them. They do appear on our website uh, next week at when, on Wednesday. Uh, we put the video up on our website and we put the answers to your questions up on our website too. So today's presenter is Erin Clark. Erin is a horticulturist at Smithsonian Gardens and she's going to talk to us about winning the war against weeds. And Erin, thank you for coming and attending our program with us. Erin had some questions that she, well, a single question that she wanted to ask you. So I'm going to start our webinar this time with a poll. And the poll is going to be about weeds, of course. What else would we be asking about? So on your screen, you see a question about what weed is your biggest problem? So if you could go ahead and answer that, then it will help Erin in her presentation and give us an idea of how, how profuse our, our weeds are in our gardens. These are our favorites. We put them up just because uh, we think that we have a problem with them in our own gardens and so we wanted to see how you were doing in your garden. Although dandelion for me is a fun one to see. It looks like nobody but me has a problem with plantain, Aaron. <laughs> so I'm going to go ahead and people are still voting madly. I'll give them a couple more sec seconds to be able to vote. And then I'll share our poll and we'll see the results. Okay, AR, here you go. So if we haven't, looks like things are slowing down a little bit. And all right, I'm ending the poll. And Aaron, it looks like Japanese stilt grass is the number one problem with a close second and third of ground ivy and crabgrass. So you got your work cut out for you. <laughs> Aaron, we would love it if you would tell us all about winning the war against weeds. And I'll be back on to ask you the questions that are of topmost concern to our audience. See you in a bit. Bye. Thanks so much, Cindy. Hi, I'm Erin. Welcome to all those who joined us today. And hopefully you guys are sipping a cup of tea or relaxing, just kind of enjoying the end of the season as we wind things down. Here at Smithsonian Gardens, we've been madly planting and we've planted lots of parsley, cabbage, kale, pansies, over top of bulbs that will bloom in the spring, like the ones you see behind me. So here's to looking forward to a beautiful spring season. I found it interesting that a lot of you do have problems with Japanese stilt grass. Maybe some of you border onto woodland areas or go hiking a lot and you've seen how much this has taken over our beautiful natural areas. So we're going to be talking about both weeds in your garden and invasive weeds in general today. Here at the Smithsonian, we don't like to ever have weeds. We really try to keep things tidy and neat for our public. And so it's a little bit high pressure you'll find that everybody has a different tolerance for what grows in their garden. And just be thinking about that today as you think about your own garden. Here's our victory garden that we have at the National Museum of American History. 
and we grow a lot of edibles in here. And this is one garden where we don't use post-emergent herbicide, we use organic methods. As I talk today, remember that there are sources to go to for all of your questions regarding invasive plants, native plants, and herbicides, different methods of dealing with weeds. That'll come from your state's land grant university extension service. So here we use the University of Maryland a lot. And you can also consider taking a pesticide application certification exam in your state. And that'll educate you on the proper use and safety around herbicides. I won't be talking too much about specific chemicals today. And we're mostly going to be talking about methods. So if you have any questions to that avail, I would encourage you to go to your extension service and to also read the label on your pesticide. So none of us like weeds, and I'm going to be talking a little bit today about how we can prevent those weeds, because Benjamin Franklin said an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And we have to think about what a weed is to each of us. So a weed is simply a plant out of place. It's a plant in the wrong place. It's a plant that you didn't grow in your garden, you didn't expect. And there are serendipitous plants that do come in that you may want to keep, but this is a plant that you want to get rid of. And there could be several reasons for that. It could be competing with your existing plants. It could be um, providing a problem for your pets. It just could be an eyesore. So let's get rid of these weeds. And the first way to do it is just by putting in the elbow grease by using all the methods at your disposal to dig those weeds out. So some of us have favorite weeding tools. A lot of horticulturists will use what's called a soil knife and spades and trowels and, and cultivators are familiar to most people. You can use a traditional hoe if you're really going after something crazy, you can use a mattock. You can also use a scuffle hoe, which looks a bit like a, a metal stirrup on the end of a pole tool. And you can also string trim and just kind of suppress the weeds, keep them at bay, knock the seed heads off, keep things a little nice and neat. There's also a physical control you can do with fire. There are people that use flamethrowers of sorts, but there's small little torch tools that you can use to simply torch the weeds between the bricks on your drive or on your walk. And that's uh, perfectly safe when used correctly. What you're going to do for your method of um, attack is see what kind of weed you're dealing with. Is it an annual weed? Is it a biennial or is it a perennial? So remember annual means year, so that's one year. This weed is run for one season, then it sets its seed. That seed will come up the next season for another one year plant. With annual weeds, you really just want to chop the tops off. Um, you don't need to go down and get the roots. A lot of times that will actually break that soil barrier and encourage more weed seeds to germinate. So one thing you can do with annual weeds is simply chop those tops off. With biennial weeds, you can try to get those rosettes the first year, that's that those basal leaves, and then you can pull it the next year if you don't get to it the first. Just make sure you pull it before that second year flowering happens. With perennial weeds, they can spread by seed, but they can also spread by stolons and rhizomes. Stolons are runners along the ground and rhizomes are, are runner roots. And some of these are the ones that you saw on the pole. There, there are dandelions and, and there are um, clovers even. So you can 
take out that whole plant or treat it with a systemic herbicide. Systemic herbicides are herbicides that once they're in contact with the leaf, they're actually taken into the plant so that they can go throughout the whole plant. They can get to the roots where you can't get. But basically prevention is the way to go. So don't leave bare ground. You're just asking for weeds to come in. Definitely try to uh, mulch areas, but even better than that is to simply fill it with ground cover plants. Don't give weeds the conditions that they want. Make sure the pH and nutrient content, the sun and water are right for the plants that you want because stressed plants give way to invaders. So if your garden plants are happy, then they're less likely to succumb to being edged out by weeds. Don't over fertilize or over water. A lot of times these really rich moist conditions can lead to a whole plethora of plants taking root. And you can consider pre-emergent. Pre-emergent is an application that you put on before plants germinate to stop them from germinating. And it affects um, the root growth. And again, pre-emergent shouldn't be used, should not be used on any vegetable crops or anything that you really plan to eat. A lot of people just like to stay away from it in general, but it certainly is an option. It's a tool out there. So now that you've set yourself up for success, if you were to weed and really go after a whole patch of weeds, you now have your bare ground. So you're gonna to have to take some after action to make sure that that doesn't repopulate with weeds. You're gonna to need to tamp down your soil, add a pre-emergent and mulch or plant ground covers. And you want to mulch in between your new plants or sow annual seed until those are established and growing together more shoulder to shoulder. Plant your replacement annuals in the fall when you pull your summer annuals. And this is something we've just done at the gardens. Again, we've planted our kale, our parsley, and our pansies and our wallflowers all over top of our bulbs for next year. And that provides a nice tight bed that will keep the weeds down, add some color, add some greenery before those bulbs pop up next spring. And here's an example. Here we have parsley. It really does well. It can grow and grow and grow through until May when a lot of times we put in our summer annuals and swallowtail butterflies love to oviposit here and their caterpillars will eat this. Now, if you're dealing with a lawn or a meadow site, some of you folks that have had trouble with stilt grass, um, make sure to overseed with your desired turf grass mix in the spring and in the fall. Consider a turf a cover crop for consider a cover crop for your vegetable areas. In the Victory Garden, we'll often plant rye, and we'll plant it by seed, and it will simply sprout up like wheat grass, and provide a nice green mulch. It'll keep the ground steady and prevent erosion and prevent a lot of weeds from coming in. And then we'll till that back in in the spring. It'll become a natural fertilizer. You can also do this with um, red clover and legumes. Again, legumes fix nitrogen in the soil. So tilling that in will help in soil fertility. And then you can cover the site with landscape fabric and mulch. So landscape fabric is something that we don't use in our beds very much. We get in there so often, we do so many change outs, but a lot of homeowners like to use landscape fabric for areas that they're not going to touch very much. You can use it at the beginning of bed establishment and simply poke holes where you plant your plants, but you're going to want to make sure to mulch it over as well to protect that fabric from UV light. Uh, again, it's not fail safe. A lot of times mulch can sort of start to break down and you'll get a little bit of a layer of soil and perfect germination conditions in between the landscape fabric and your mulch and you might still get weeds. 
but it is something that people do use to help out. Now, last resort is chemical control. We really try not to spray a lot. We're very mindful of our bee populations, our other pollinators, we're mindful of the public. But when you do need to use an herbicide, there are a few different types to use. And you can learn more about these again from your extension service and from taking the pesticide applicator certification for your given state. We've talked about pre-emergent herbicide and that is what you use to create a barrier to germination. And you do that in the early season, maybe again in late summer for your winter weeds, which we'll talk about in a minute. Your post-emergent herbicides, a lot of times they're non-selective or systemic, and that means it will just kill any plant it touches, grass or forb. And you can count on that to be fairly effective, but again, you wanna use it sparingly. These, these are the products that will touch the leaves and be taken into the plant and slowly suppress that plant or kill that plant and make it hard for it to carry out its life cycle. Again, it doesn't really matter whether it's weeds or the plants you love. So when you're spraying, you always have to be mindful of the drift and exactly where you're applying, be very careful. There are, emer there are post emergents that are selective. For example, only for broadleaf weeds rather than your grasses, and a lot of times those are used in turf grass management. Some herbicides are contact, and again, some are systemic, moving through the entire plant. If you were to use a more organic method like vinegar, again, it has to be a very high concentration of vinegar, and it's still dangerous to use. You'd want to use eye protection and gloves. Uh, it might only burn the leaves of the plant. It's not going to be as systemic necessarily. And so you might need to come back again and again and slowly weaken that plant. So these organic controls are really about thinking about the whole picture once again. You're thinking about prevention. You're thinking about closing the gaps, using those landscape fabrics. Some people have used corn gluten and it is a bit pricey and it is a natural pre-emergent and it feeds at the same time. It's kind of like a weed and feed. Um, it doesn't really kill pre-existing weeds. It suppresses annual weeds. It, it makes it harder for them to root. And there are several more organic herbicides that have come out that you can look up. Bottom line, South Dakota State Extension had a really, really great list. And a lot of these are things that look like they'd be good to eat, but are definitely dangerous. So there are all these things that you have in small concentrations in foods naturally, but in these concentrations, they can really pack a punch. They're either a very strong acid or a sulfate. So again, just because it's organic doesn't mean it has no risks, but when used properly, these can be excellent. It might take several applications, but it is definitely worth a try. One of the methods in preventing weeds to begin with is to set up your bed right. When you're setting up an entirely new bed, let's say you're making it from turf grass and trying to set up a garden bed, you can start this time of year. This is a perfect time. And a lot of people do lasagna gardening. You can layer alternate layers of newspaper straw, compost leaves, grass clippings, and you can let it sit for a few months and do its thing. And then you dig it up and turn it over in the spring. You're mixing all those great layers together and they'll have broken down over the year. Now, a lot of people will want to use unseasoned mulch or wood chips 
And the problem with using those are they can cause a high nitrogen to carbon ratio, sorry, a high carbon to nitrogen ratio. So you'll need to add green organic matter matter and compost to make your soil fertile again. So I wouldn't recommend using hardwood chips, but if you're gonna use a mulch, stick with leaf mulch and um, very aged mulch and use a lot of different layers of things, lots of compost, grass clippings, etc. Keep that organic matter high. Another thing about weeds is really thinking about what you're willing to put up with. Do you need to get to 100%? Do you want to encourage more pollinators? And so maybe you don't want to spray. Often it's more sustainable to actually grow numerous things together in turf grass. It doesn't have to be a monoculture. And we're trying that here at Smithsonian Gardens with bee lawns. And bee lawns are lawns where you still have forbs or flowering plants in with your grasses for the bees to come and harvest. So you can do this with clover. And we've actually established some grass mixes with clover. And this is not a new idea. This has been done um, uh, decades before simply to extend the season of green to make turf grass do well in certain areas where it might not. And so people used to put clover in the mixes all the time. And now that we're once again, more tolerant of something that's not a monoculture and more tolerant of mixes, we're thinking about pollinators a lot more and thinking about what they might need and thinking that this might be a much more sustainable way to manage some of our turf grass areas in the future. And you can't want to think about your timing. So whenever you plan out your garden tasks, you can set up a calendar and you're going to want to do your pre-emergent pretty early in the season. Um, and then you're not going to want to touch that layer for a while. Now in areas where we do annual change outs, like in May or October, we'll put down that pre-emergent right after planting. So you don't want to use it in areas on edibles or places where pets can get and definitely follow those instructions. And it, once again, with post emergence, your timing is going to depend a lot on the weather. So watch out for any wind, anything that could cause your spray to drift and simply use it sparingly. So here we're going to get into our enemies, the weeds. And we're going to talk about broadleaf weeds first. And they come in different categories, the annuals, the biannuals, and the perennials. Again, those annuals are just up for the one year. You can definitely just chop off the tops if you need to. And that might prevent you from disturbing that layer. And you're going to get those seeds. Biennials, again, they, they're a little bit easier to get rid of because you can simply dig up the rosettes or go for the seeds if they're in their second year. Perennials is where it gets a little bit more difficult. You're, even though it says simple, <laughs> you're actually um, going to be attacking these dandelions, these plantains, the curly dock. You'll notice curly dock is in all three lists because it can actually bloom in one season, it can bloom the second season. Um, you can kind of use a lot of the different methods on it as if it were an annual, a biennial, or a perennial. And it's most commonly referred to as a perennial. Pardon me. So we'll be talking about these various weeds as we go on. With perennials, we'll be talking about simple weeds, things that simply either have a tap root or, or one little rosette of leaves and spreading perennials, things that really will spread out across the ground. So with annual weeds, again, it's simple, just don't let them go to seed and you'll be fine. And now that we're getting into winter, 
we're going to start to see winter weeds. One of them is chickweed. You're also going to see henbit and dead nettle. And these are two close real, closely related lamiums. Henbit, you can see, has more of a world leaf, and dead nettle has more of a heart shaped leaf. But they're both annuals. You're going to treat them the same way. You can easily pop them out, but if you don't want to disturb that soil layer and stir up more seed, you can simply um, shear them down, keep them from growing to seed. In the summertime, you'll see a lot of different annual weeds. One of those is black medic or trefoil. And that is a really hardy weed because again, it's a legume, it's making its own nitrogen. It's kind of making its own way in the world. Now, both mints, sorry, both dead nettle and um, henbit are a part of the mint family. And so you're going to notice that again, mint spread and a lot of these weeds have those same tendencies. They have the square stems, they have the flower shapes that go along with the mint family, but they'll also spread like mints. Biennial weeds are weeds you can take out year one or two. First year, you're going to go after that basil rosette. Year two, you're going to go after the seeds if you don't want to dig up the whole plant. Common verdict is one of these biennials. One plant can produce 15,000 seeds. And some people have a lot of problems with this plant. Some people just see it as something fun that they can um, use. You can make different things with it. And this is the one that has the huge brown burrs on it. Getting into perennial weeds, just dig them out. A lot of times you're just going to have to just dig them out unless you're going to treat them with an herbicide and really get on it. Curly dock, again, that's that biennial that's often um, listed as a perennial because it can bloom that same season. And that has the, the rosette. You can see how many seeds could form on that stem. And you can see why you won't, wouldn't want that to get away from you. Dandelions. Dandelions are our gift from the British. So we have them now. Um, there are some native, but all those yellow dandelions that you see, those, those are from the Brits. And it is not a legume, pardon, it does not fix it fix its own nitrogen, but you want to um, hand dig these guys. The thing about dandelions is it's often best to hit them right after they flowered, when they're in a weaker state, if you're going with herbicides. But of course, if you're physically getting rid of them, you want to get them before they flower, before those puff balls spread all our seed. Now, if you have plantain, you probably have compacted soil. And this is another one that you're just going to want to dig out. Ground ivy, I can usually tell by the smell. Even though it looks a little bit like henbit, it's on a different season. It's more of a summer perennial. And it loves rich, moist conditions. It's also in the mint family, really a spreader. And you're going to want to treat your grass a certain way if you have it in your lawn. You're going to want to have deep, infrequent waterings, increase the drainage in your turf, actually increase the nutrients, and increase the aeration. And bindweed. Everybody loves bindweed, don't we? So if you're lucky, you just have a little bit here on the ground. but it's like an iceberg. It's hiding a whole wealth of roots and rootlets underneath a lot of different nodes that can break up. So you don't want to till it um, to break it up because each plant piece can start its own <laughs> colony of sorts. And a lot of times these will 
take over, they'll grow up your shrubs and up your trees. And it's kind of a perennial problem that keeps coming back. They can last years and years in the soil and go very, very, very deep. So it is hard to get rid of, but a lot of people will do systemic herbicides for this plant. You can also smother but again, that's suppressing since it can live for so many years. Now, talking about clover, this is another one of our perennial weeds, but as we said, we're experimenting with it as a bee lawn. They're really helpful for pollinators. So let's talk about our grasses and sedges. Um, for a lot of people, grass is just grass but there's a lot going on in there. A lot of people have crabgrass and people will treat for that in the spring with a crabgrass preventer because it is something that comes on strong in the warm season. There's barnyard grass, there's Bermuda grass and zoysia grass. In the cool season, you'll actually have some of your annual bluegrass. Uh, a lot of the turf mixes that we like are actually cool season grasses and that's why Lawns are so stressed during the summer. And there's also perennial quack grass. You can get um, a lot of upper growth in the spring and then root growth in the summer. And so if you do a systemic, that'll be working on those roots during the summer. Sedges are different from grasses. Um, we were always taught sedges have wedges. And that's because if you look at the leaf, it's a little more triangular. And the reason why this is important is because they act differently from a lot of grasses and they are really tough to kill. A lot of your run of the mill herbicides don't work so well on sedges. And so you might wanna get something that targets them specifically. Again, if you pull it out and you leave little bits of roots in the ground, it's just gonna spread. So most people try to deal um, with this with a very specific um, herbicide for sedges. Now let's get into invasive plants. So some of these weeds aren't just weeds. Some of these weeds are warriors in their own right and they're taking over the countryside and you'll see them when you go out on hikes you'll see them in the woods. Um, for anyone in the Mid-Atlantic, you'll see how English ivy simply planted in gardens is taking over everything. It climbs up trees at a certain height. It can even bloom. Birds can carry those seeds. It'll creep down hills as it runs together and in riparian systems, it'll even follow waterways. And so if, if someone has planted English ivy further uphill, it'll often end up in the waterways, in yards and woods further down. And this has happened over decades and decades. Luckily, there are a lot of weed warriors that really focus on destroying these invasives. And it can actually be pretty fun if you go out with the group to get rid of English ivy, you can simply cut an entire mass and start to roll it up like a carpet, cutting and chopping and, and digging as you go. Japanese still grass actually comes out very, very easily. It's very easy to weed. It's, there's just a lot of it. And you'll see this a lot up in Maryland near Catoctin. You'll see some vines that look pretty, but are quite deviant. Porcelain berry vine has berries that can be blue or purple or pink, oftentimes all in the same cluster. But again, it's very invasive. It was introduced here, it doesn't belong here. Garlic mustard is one of the plants that has been focused on here in the Mid-Atlantic quite a bit. And you'll find it out on the Billy Goat Trail, near Great Falls, it really does take over the woodlands. And even vinca or periwinkle, this is a common garden plant, but now it's really considered invasive. So a lot of people have it as a weed. 
the trees that you're going to watch want to watch out for are elm trees. Now put Chinese and Siberian elm in here because those are the ones that are technically invasive. However, our own American elm here on the mall loves to reproduce and we have elm seedlings that we deal with all the time. They're native, but we don't want them. They're weed in our gardens. And so you'll find with weed trays, you really got to get it early when it's still pullable. If it gets to, you know, a finger in caliper, you're going to want to start digging it. You might even have to use a weed wrench to get it out of the ground. So the sooner you can get on those woody weeds, the better. Uh, if any of you have done training with a weed warrior team or worked at some place like the National Arboretum, you'll know they go after Japanese honeysuckle and multiflora rose. They, there are shrubs that have simply been introduced through gardens and have gone rampant and have taken over a lot of our native areas. They make it hard for some of the native wildlife. Some of the native wildlife love it, love the seeds, but they also make it hard for the native foliage. So garlic mustard is a biennial. It's pretty easy to pull. The first year is just that rosette of basil leaves, and then you're going to want to grab it before that second year bloom, before it spreads more. It seems to have allelopathic properties, which means it can actually prevent other plants from growing. And um, this is the same reason why it should be um, Cooked. Don't put this in your compost. Go ahead and send it to landfill waste. I've added a recipe for cooking your garlic mustard. If you want to eat and feast and forage as you weed. And I also wanted to remind everyone that if you're going to go out in the woods and weed for a cause, be sure to check with the local authorities. If it's not your property, you'll always want to check with either the state or local authorities, or if it's federal lands, likewise. So there is hope at the end of the tunnel. Um, we've talked a lot about using ground covers and various garden plants, and a lot of native plants can compete with weeds and can help your pollinators. So I wanted to give you guys a few tools. One of them is the USDA plants database. And you can go on here, if you know the name of the plant, either a common or a scientific name, put it into that database and it will show you whether it's native or not. As you can see, this map is green and that means that the plant is entirely native. If the map shows blue, that means that it's introduced to North America from either Asia or Europe or South America, another continent. There's a lot of different resources that provide good lists. This is um, a list that I compiled um, on my own and looking at the Master Gardeners of Northern Virginia site. They actually have a really good list of native ground covers that you can use. This will be up next week for reference. You have plenty of bloomers on here. You have a pack of Sandra that's native. And you have woodland plants. At the end, you'll see carrot Pennsylvanica. And I spelled that wrong. It's only one N for Pennsylvanica. That is a beautiful plant. It's, it's delicate looking. It covers the ground well. It's a nice grass for a woodland setting. Out in the sun, you can use yarrow. Uh, yarrow is medicinal. It's kind of a pan um, northern hemisphere plant all around the world. Just remember, whatever you do, fill those links in and fill the ranks.
the orange that you see here is a milkweed called Asclepias tuberosa, and it'll attract pollinators while it's covering your ground, while it's getting rid of weeds. Those pods that you see that formed eventually pop open into white fluffy seeds that spread around and you're just spreading more good native plants. There's a taller milkweed, common milkweed, Asclepia syriac, that um, a lot of times monarchs will use as they travel through. And this is seen in a lot of roadside ditches. It used to be kind of on the edges of farmland, but as those areas get tilled, there's not enough milkweed anymore. So we at Smithsonian Gardens encourage everyone to grow more milkweed so that we can help the butterflies on their way. This is really the food that monarch caterpillars need. So monarch butterflies will lay their eggs on milkweed. The caterpillar will hatch, will start eating milkweed leaves, will ingest those toxins that will then make it poisonous to birds. So it has a higher likelihood of survival. And those caterpillars can then become butterflies and migrate as well. Rebecca triloba is one of my favorites. It's a really great ground cover, pretty easy care. Pollinators love it. Golden ragwort. Here's one where there might be more opinions on whether it's a plant or a weed. It is native, wonderfully native. Um, but then it's seeds will actually end up looking a lot like dandelion fluff if you let it go to seed. So it just depends on what your aesthetic is and whether you're prepared to defend it as a native plant or whether you're going to say, no, my, my neighbor's will think that is a weed and go ahead and stay away. A beautiful native plant is woodland phlox, phlox vericata. This is a cultivar called Blue Moon that works very well in our landscapes. It blooms in April and all those basal leaves form a really nice ground cover throughout the rest of the year. I've put in some good resources. Again, this presentation will be up next week. So you can check out the Kepler Center for Home Gardening from Missouri Botanic Garden. They have excellent fact sheets on various plants, as well as annual weeds, both summer and winter, and a lot of different weed resources you might want to look into. And again, most of these sources on here are going to be .edu's. These are universities that have really great extension services that do crop research, but then also talk to homeowners about what they can do in their own yards. Again, I'd like to shout out the Master Gardeners of Northern Virginia. And thank you all for joining me. Now, are there any questions? Yes, a lot. <laughs> um, <laughs> thank you, Erin. I really appreciate that. Uh, you did a good job, overall job of giving lots of good information out there. I think what, oh yeah, please, if you would stop sharing your screen, then people will just see us. But those uh, resources that you posted will be available in online next week, so they'll be able to get a hold of. But I think the main question people have is how to get rid of everything, of course. But I think what, at least in my experience, and what I love to share with everyone, you could be diligently pulling weeds, uh, the flower, for years and years and years, and don't let it flower, and don't let it go to seed. But trouble is, you may have inherited a seed bank that has so many seeds in the soil that you are going to be fighting this battle for a long time. So knowing that and knowing how I've handled that situation sometimes, I'm wondering, do you have you had good luck with putting clear plastic down over an area, not over your garden bed, of course, but over an area that you want to start anew or you want to just give up on what's in there and, and really start anew? Uh, have you had success with leaving black plastic or clear plastic down to get rid of 
uh, a majority of the weeds, not the seed bank, but the weeds that are in existence. Yeah, I, I haven't tried that at my public garden sites. That is a big problem. And a lot of times we have the luxury of volunteers. That's a luxury that we don't have this year. So we've, we've done a lot of elbow grease and, and some herbicide applications. Mm -hmm. But if you have a seed bank, you know, a very old garden over years and years, we've also done soil change outs where we get rid of old garden soil and we bring in an entirely new mix. Mm -hmm. And sometimes yeah. it's best to start fresh. Yeah, that's a tough one because you don't know, necessarily know what you're getting either. So mm -hmm. um, it, it, it is an option. I have never tried to do that because I'm always want to work with the soil that I have. Since we have very good clay soil and clay soil is filled with minerals, I'd rather just augment. But I always say that uh, one of the reasons that we are professionals is because we've battled the weeds so long. <laughs> we know that that's going to be on our job description forever. <laughs> and we know that they're going to come. But there are some major ones that we really have to address, uh, both because they're doing damage to our native sites as well of our, as well of our gardens. Mm -hmm. So Japanese silk grass has popped up again and again in questions. Uh, what would you suggest for handling Japanese silk grass? Um, the methods I've seen used in volunteer projects is hand pulling. Yeah. It really is just getting in there and getting it out. Yeah. Um, I would, I would, a lot of these natural areas are areas that you're not going to be able to get to again and again to spray and you might do some damage when you do. So mm -hmm. hand pulling would be the recommendation. Right, and spraying, realize that spraying will get rid of the, the weeds that are there at the time, mm -hmm. but it's not going to do a thing to the seed bank. So Yeah, and you've also, yeah. you've created almost a desert where it's a blank slate, where more things can come in and colonize. And a lot of times yeah. those things are invasive plants. Yeah, yeah even some of our natives, and we don't call them invasives because they're not pushing, because uh, uh, they are natives, but mm -hmm. they can be a problem as well too. So I'm looking at uh, all the different questions that are popping up. And how about, you did mention uh, English ivy, but how about na uh, uh, poison ivy? I know it's, an, it's a native, so it has yeah. a use, but. <laughs> poison ivy is native, it's, it's a good source. Um, a food for birds and it's really bad for people <laughs> and yeah. some people seem to be magically immune some people are terribly allergic and some people develop allergies over time mm -hmm. and i would just give a lot of caution when working with poison ivy um, i've worked with it a lot long sleeves gloves eye protection even you can pull the poison ivy off the trees you can try and yank the roots out. But again, that entire plant has that urushal oil in it. So you're going to have to launder that all of your clothes with an oil product, something that's going to take that urushal out. And don't burn it. When you're getting rid of poison ivy, do <laughs> not burn it because even those volatile oils get into the air, they can get into your lungs and cause serious damage. So just use a lot of caution, a lot of personal protective equipment and bag it up, throw it away, but don't burn it. Right. You can actually even, this sounds terrible, but you can add it to your compost, but you can, not the, not the vine part of it, because that's not going to break down very quickly because the leaves will break down and it's not going to uh, infect the compost. You're not going to get poison ivy from uh, compost that has it in it after it's totally broken down. But I've never done it because I don't, if, if I walk by poison ivy, I get poison ivy. So Right, right. Yeah. You're, you're, <laughs> count, you're counting on that time and that heat to break right. things down. Right. Um, and again, I don't have experience with that. Mm -hmm. um, I, I always just throw that away. But the uh, 
it's important to realize that just because you don't see the leaves on poison ivy doesn't mean it's not still active. You can still get those oils simply by brushing up against the vine. Uh, so it's important to learn how to recognize it in winter and in summer. They have these upward facing shoots that you'll see. And then if it's on a tree, you'll see just a big hairy vine and you can spot it right away. That's poison ivy. Yep, it is. It has a beautiful white berry, so don't use it in your fall arrangements. Mm -hmm. uh, always something uh, that I've heard from, from different students and different volunteers. Uh, they want to use the white berries in their wreaths, and I... Mm. Uh, but other things that you can think about. Uh, when is the best time? You, you touched on it a little bit, but when is the best time to be able to get rid of some of these weeds? If I'm thinking of an annual weed, uh, I love the tip that you gave. If you're going to spray dandelions, do it after its energy level is low. And I think that holds true for most weeds. Would you say that that is true to get rid of it uh, when it's its very weakest, like English ivy or any of them? Yes. So um, the caveat to that is a lot of times it's weaker after it's flowered. So it will have done some damage. It's already flowered and set seed, but then the plant itself is weaker um, as it's, you know, sending energy back down into the roots. And that's that's when sometimes those systemics can really work going back down into the roots. But um, dandelion, it can bloom in the spring and in the fall. So anytime you see it, just dig it. Mm -hmm. I've also found that if I have a big expanse of a perennial uh, weed, that it's really good to mow it down before it goes to seed or flower and seed, and then come back and attack it. So use an herbicide on it after it starts to regrow again. Of course, most herbicides need those leaves to absorb and then mm -hmm. systemically uh, go down into the roots. So if you've already weakened the weed by mowing it, uh, and getting rid of it that way and then wait for some greenery to pop back up. That's a really good way to be able to get rid of uh, some perennial. Mm -hmm. Not annual so much, but <laughs> at least uh, perennial. It works really well on uh, some of the problems that I've had in my gardens and in my yard. And that, that even works on English ivy. English ivy is notoriously hard to kill, but um, if you do cut it like that, and then that new very lime green gr growth gets hit, then you'll really put a hurting on it. Yep, that's true. And there were many other weeds that we didn't mention that uh, people have had questions about, uh, like bindweed, uh, and I'm sorry, not bindweed, like, um, why can't I think of the flower? Morning glory, <laughs> morning glory, and uh, uh, so many other things that are out there. And really, I love to stress the fact that you've got to get things before they flower because once they flower and put seed in, that's why morning glory, we love to look at little blossoms and it's so cute. Uh, but then who wants to go in and deadhead all those flowers off before they go to seed uh, so that it doesn't spread. And once the morning glory has bloomed and, and spread seed, that's it for a long mm -hmm. time. Until and, and the roots are pernicious. It's a lot like bindweed. Yes, uh, yes. There's another plant, um, sweet peas you know i was i was so excited when i found out that there was a perennial sweet pea but guess what i've seen it growing out in natural areas so that's mm -hmm. quite invasive as well um, a, a lot of the action is going on underneath the soil and so again that's that's where you don't even want to plant it to begin with but systemic herbicide might help and that's what uh i have always hesitated to say that japanese stilt grass is an annual it is an annual but in our area, it's an annual. I'm starting to see it produce um, like kudzu, that as we get warmer, the soil stays warmer and those, those rhizomes underneath, those spreading roots really stay warmer. And I'm not sure what's gonna happen to it in the future. Mm -hmm. uh, I've had a lot of experience with still grass in my garden in the back and it came from the forest, so. But, you know, we said, I introduced you at the beginning, but I didn't tell people where they could find you. So in case they have questions, they can come down. So Aaron Clark, 
you're a horticulturist at the American History, but what do you do at American History? Hi, yes. I work um, around the building of American History. We have several different themed gardens. We have a victory garden that showcases how people would have grown crops during World War II. We have some of those same old heirloom varieties, and we have some new signs that we've put up for that. Our gardens are open if you feel like you need to come and get away from it all. And American History is also open from Friday through Tuesday right now. Mm -hmm. I work up on the terrace of American History as well. We've put in a garden called Common Ground, our American garden. And that has a lot of your uh, old favorites, the lavender and the roses. And it has things that remind people of their heritage and how we all have common ground. And so we really appreciate um, when people come by and stop and smell the roses. We do have roses still blooming. So yeah, come by and visit sometime. Yeah, and that's a good point because common ground is such a good introduction. The fact that uh, plants have been introduced from many different areas as well as mingle with our native plants here. Mm -hmm. And some of our uh, uh, most endearing weeds have been brought over for a purpose. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm, I'm trying to stay positive here because I know. And mugwort is one of those. Uh, someone asked oh, about yeah. mugwort. And it's one of those that has really a good cultural use. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was brought over for a very good reason. But when, yeah. yep, yep. <laughs> so have you ever tried to get rid of mugwort? I have. Uh, it's hard. It's hard. You, you really have to dig down. It kind of has these curved um, stems that continue, you know, kind of working their fingers into things down below the surface. So again, that's that's when we're systemic herbicides or just really digging and digging over multiple seasons yep. and weaken it enough. Yep. So the tips seem to be centered around a co like several common themes. One, do not let your weeds go to flower and go to seed. Pull them before you can. So diligence in the garden uh, is one of the most important things. When you pull those weeds, if they have gone to flower, do not put them in your compost. Do not send them to the uh, uh, county to be able to be used in compost making. Bag them and throw them out because they're going to reproduce and then you're giving the problem to somebody else. Dig diligently to be able to get little pieces out of the ground, things like bindweed, um, nutsedge, uh, ground ivy, uh, mugwort that we just mentioned. Uh, so diligently get them out. And if you want to be able to spray something, an herbicide, find the right one, which we can use herbicides that other people can't use in a public garden because we have different licensing, correct? Uh, so if you're looking, you have to check with your extension office to see what's safe to use at home. And then hit it when it's at its weakest point. Don't let it go to flower, mow over it, chop it, cut it off, cut the heads off, <laughs> but then go ahead and spray because you're gonna have better luck uh, to get eliminate something if it's already in a weakened condition. Correct. Did I wrap that up for, for uh, how you would suggest taking care of weeds? Yep, yep, just, uh, you know, grab a friend, Grab a drink if you need. <laughs> it's, it's a long you will afterwards. <laughs> call, um, to take care of weeds, but um, if you use some preventative techniques and you keep at it, you really can um, make your garden what you want and edit it to what you want. That's a perfect way to end. Make your garden the way you want. Fill it so you see the plants that you want to see, and then there'll be less room for those weeds. Thank you, Aaron. It was terrific information. We appreciate you joining us today, and we appreciate your knowledge of the weeds and all the work that you have done as a weed warrior at Smithsonian Gardens. <laughs> Thank you. And next week, we'll see you all again. And in the meantime, get out in the garden today and start pulling those winter weeds because the, some of them are starting to flower, and you don't want to add to that seed bank. So we'll see you all next week. Bye-bye. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you.